salutations! Welcome to Loving the Language of Literacy. My name is Sophia Lee and today I'll be discussing All the Bright Places by Jennifer Niven. Backstory before I start this actual video. I haven't filmed in a week. And this is so surprising considering I'm Sophia. Last Friday I had this unusual filming kick where I filmed three videos in one night and I think two of them are up at the moment. Anyways, I haven't filmed in such a long time and it's kind of nice again to be in front of the camera. And another pre-backstory to the actual review itself is that the minute I finished this book I was like, I don't have that much to say about it, why would I book talk it? Or even review it on my blog. But then, came home, wrote down a few things for my review and it ended up being pretty long of a list, especially because I have lots of individual plot points to, to discuss in this video and I normally don't do that, so let's dive right in. What is All the Bright Places about? All the Bright Places is a contemporary novel following two main characters as well as dual point of views of Violet and Finch. They meet on a bell tower at their school and they kind of connect and save each other from committing suicide as they wander around the state known as Indiana. If this sounds completely weird and completely off, it is. It is kind of mind effing and you don't really know what's going on most of the time, but you love it anyways. On my scale, I gave it a 94%. I absolutely love it and respect it and I agree with the hype entirely. This only came out, I believe, on the 6th of January. My memory is so terrible. I probably don't know when it came out. But it came out sometime in January and everyone has been raving. They've been saying their souls have been crushed and their hearts have been broken and that this book is just so good. And let me tell you, it is. I would recommend this book for fans of The Fault in Our Stars, The Beginning of Everything, Anatomy of a Misfit, and even All the Light We Cannot See. Obviously, All the Light We Cannot See, an adult historical fiction novel about a blind girl and a Nazi boy is obviously a lot different from all the bright places. Mainly the reason I'd recommend it for this is because Finch and Violet both have their own unique quality in the way they tell their story that makes it sound so real and so raw and just so wow you characters really get me kind of thing that you find in those books I mentioned. Finch especially at first seems like Ezra from the beginning of everything. He kind of diverges away from that into his own character. And while I did enjoy Finch's both narration and character more than I did Violet, she definitely st held her own in the story. I really enjoyed her character as well. She was also more relatable to me and I would kind of say that she was like the main character of Anatomy of a Misfit but kind of not. I'm going to tell you why I think that these two books are actually similar. If you haven't already seen, both these titles have things to do with light, and in the literary world, all light kind of symbolizes goodness, purity, innocence, positivity in dark places. And this book is kind of a downer, so don't read this if you're looking for a cutesy romance to pick you up. And this book is most definitely downer. This was the last book I finished in January and it took me quite a long time and I was just so emotionally drained afterwards. But I would say almost that All the Bright Places is a Y adaptation of this book and it's not because of the premise or the setting or the plot but of the same feeling you get from the book. Same kind of deep emotional resonance you take away from both of them. The characters in both books go through so much. Obviously Marie and Werner from All the Love I Cannot See have it a lot worse, but in All the Bright Places we get to really dive into and focus on these really disturbed characters and it is quite an interesting thought-provoking read that I would highly recommend. This is Jennifer Niven's first YA novel. She's written I think three or four year adult ones and I can kind of see why she's an adult author because this was totally a young adult novel. They were, it was in high school, they were teenagers, yada yada yada. But the morals and the lesson behind the story itself were a lot deeper than the, your average YA novel. This was extremely hyped up by Random House and I would have to admit that it's partly because of this wonderful wonderful cover. I saw it in the bookstores when I first heard about it and 
if you actually touch it, it's very textured and the cover itself is just so beautiful and exactly what you think of when you think of a contemporary novel. It's understated and there's the symbolism of the finch and the violet and guess what stupid Sophia didn't pick up on me? This is kind of divided into parts. You don't really understand how the parts are divided when you first read it, but it's divided by these lovely little graphics that I did not understand until I saw like the third one. And the post-it notes have a lot of resonance with the book, especially with the font, and the back is just such a wonderful presentation of the graphic post-it notes and the dead violence, second of all. And I'm going to read you just what the back says really quickly. I was just sitting there on the railing. I didn't come up here to, you know, jump. Let me ask you something. Do you think there's such a thing as a perfect day? What? A perfect day, start to finish, when nothing terrible or sad or ordinary happens. Do you think it's possible? I don't know. Have you ever had one? No. I've never had one either, but I'm looking for it. Thank you, Theodore Finch, for saving me. If you ever tell anyone about this, I'll kill you. This alone just demonstrates the wonderful dynamic the two characters have, as well as the snark and sarcasm that I love to read about. In terms of my background and backstory, there really isn't that much besides what I've already said, but I do have to admit that this took me a freakishly long time to read, considering what this book is. But it's already the 6th of February, and I've only read two books, so I don't know what's going on with me. Anyways, this took me quite a long time, kind of because of the depth, kind of because of me choosing other things rather than than reading, but it was so, so good. The pacing at some points was a little bit slow, but on another day I, I can imagine myself just sitting down on a Saturday afternoon and completely tearing this apart and just sinking my teeth into it. And unlike usual, I'll have to say goodbye to the non-spoilery people. I know it's really soon, in the review, for Sophia at least, but there is a lot for me to discuss, so I would love for you to come back and we can discuss this, this book because I have so many feels and just so many mind-blowing things at, and just, oh my god, the words are gone. And really quickly, I read this along with my good friends Jackie and Caitlin, and I will link in the doobly-doo their reviews or their feedback for this book because you've got to know that it's not just me who loves it. Goodbye, non-spoiler people. Goodbye. Hey, I'm back. Anyways, uh, I have a lot of individual plot points to talk to you about, and I normally, as a reviewer, don't do individual plot points and more of just the overall story itself, but I've got to talk to you about this. My finishing reaction for this book is what gave this not a complete 100% because I was not in love with the ending. It was the same thing that kind of ruined the beginning of everything for me by Robin Schneider. I'll link the review right here. But the ending was so similar. I don't, I'm not at all saying that it's too similar or that she copied, but just the feeling and absence it left you with. I love the dual perspective. Everyone knows I love multi-perspective, but especially with this novel where I didn't feel like one character was stronger than the other. They were just so full of life and perspective, and it is so sad that... Theodore actually killed himself. There was a lot of symbolism as well in this novel, such as the pool, and I loved Jennifer Niven's writing style and how she described it, and that theory of science, with starting with the J that I can't actually pronounce, where there's an infinite pool and he just kept going down and down into it. Just so much thought-provoking depth that if I weren't a teenager myself and knew that people could think like this, I would just be completely mind-blown. And I would love to meet either of these characters in real life. They are such inspiring people, but at the same time they've gone through so much in their lives. I'm going to talk about Violet first, and I thought it was interesting that they brought in the whole death and grief aspect to this book, because there was a lot to deal with by itself, but I think Niven kind of wanted an extra boost for Violet and her character, and I thought that the way that Violet dealt with this was a bit uncalled for, because she just kept dwelling on it and dwelling on it, and someone who's lost someone I completely understand the feeling, but at the same time, how did the teachers let her, nine months later, be excused from projects? They kept being extenuating circumstances, and those just kept going on throughout the book. I feel like they symbolized, you'll hear me saying that a lot in this review, I feel like they symbolized just way more than the fact that she didn't want to write a stupid paper, but just the way that she's just stuck in this rut and she doesn't know where to go, and it isn't until she meets Finch that she kind of gets out of it. 
And at the same time, their relationship is not whatsoever like, Oh my god, I met this guy and now I'm whole again. There was just this complete healing process of the two of them learning how to live again. She had such goals and, out and such a different aspect in life and she just gave up basically when Eleanor passed away and again I don't really understand this that much. I thought it was interesting that she was the writer of a web magazine slash blog. I never really got the vibe whether it was one or the other and Eleanor and Violet.com first of all sounded great. I'd love to read about it now but the way that she developed Dura Magazine which is a real thing that Jennifer Niven is an editor-in-chief for was just really interesting and I was like you go girl you've got to keep writing because she felt like she kind of lost her voice after the whole ordeal and I really like how she found it again, especially with that scene between her and her mom. Because while we get a lot of face-to-face -face parent confronting ch parent-child moments, they were a lot more confrontational and not as much just heart-to-heart, -heart, and I love that. I enjoyed the reluctant romance, but at the same time, I think that they could have cut to the chase a little bit faster because it was obvious she liked Finch, but at the same time, they came out of nowhere. This happened to me with The Winner's Curse by Marie Rutkotsky, where I felt like they loved each other, I knew they loved each other, but at the same time, when they actually did get together, it seemed kind of rushed, which seems weird. And I'm still not really sure how I feel about Theodore Finch's death, because while I disliked it, I think it was really a good element to just throw in there and catch us completely off guard as readers, so I really want to know what you thought about it. Finch, on the other hand, had such multiple personalities, and this isn't just I feel this way one day and I feel this way another, but as you know if you've read the book, which I think you have if you're watching this point, he was all over the place. He was 80s Finch one day, he was all American Finch one day, he was badass jock kind of person one day, and he kept doing this, and it wasn't just when he was a teenager, but throughout the whole years of his childhood when Violet saw the pictures and photographs on his wall. His death was extremely hard-hitting, and I felt like there was something going to happen after he t swallowed all the pills, because he had this remorse, and even went to Life is Life, which, is, which was the support group afterwards, when he tried to overdose, but at the same time, it was like, why would you do this? You have Violet. Compared to where you were before, you are in a very good shape, and... I know with suicide people it's a lot different and I have no way of knowing or understanding this but I just felt kind of like, what the F Finch, like you betrayed us as readers. I couldn't really get a good grip on him either because of what I just said. He was this kind of character where he slipped through your fingers right as you thought you actually knew who he was. I loved the birthday scene but at the same time I hated it because of what happened but it just seemed so sweet and after so much seriousness out of the entire book it was so sweet that he went through so much effort for her and it was his birthday but of course it was like his joy was in giving her such a good celebration just because she found out that he goes to life is life does not mean that he should first of all commit suicide and throw his life away. I also love the, both the symbolism and the actual action where he kept running away from his problems because I'm a long distance runner myself and I, kn I understood exactly the feelings and emotions he felt when he just took off on the road. What I loved about their relationship was that they were just such deep thinkers and they were so thought-provoking to me as a reader, as well as just their overall outlook and perspective on life and how they dealt with things that were thrown at them, and I loved it so much. Their concept, that which I read about on the back of the book, about perfect days, was just so interesting. And obviously perfection is, first of all, overrated, and second of all, um, unreachable. But when you're in a relationship and you really like or even love that person, you just have this connection with them. And I loved the way that it was both described and carried out beautifully, and the progression of that was just astounding. They both saved each other. And like I said before, it wasn't in the cliche way, but it was just so heart-wrenching to see their gradual connection and the way that they're basically made for each other. How Finch thought that he was either three times faster or three times slower than everyone else. He either got exactly what was going on and was bored with life or he was just so slow and left behind. I love the way this was described and how 
this happens to actual people in real life. The wandering was such a fun aspect of the story. It made it feel kind of like an Amy and Rogers epic detour just for the wandering part because they had no idea what they were going. They were just going with it. And they found the bookstore in the... in the... What is that called? In the mobile home and the mini roller coaster in the guy's backyard and the highest place in Indiana. And it was just so many both physical and mental milestones in their relationship and the story's progression. It's something I love about their relationship so much and if I am ever in a relationship I would totally love to do. And this was they were quoting literature back and forth to each other. They quoted Virginia Woolf and then other authors and it was just so, I felt so giddy as a book lover myself. I was like, oh my god, you guys are so cute. And lastly, what I think was it was extremely interesting of a decision for Jennifer Niven to have the story counting up and counting down because Theodore Finch was counting up from the days that he was awakened, so to speak, and Violet was counting down to the days to graduation. And I thought this was so interesting because eventually they'd have to meet together in terms of the timeline and just the little headers at the top of the chapters were so interesting to think about and be like, oh my god, these are milestones in people's life and this is what actually happens. It was so raw and relatable and not even in a picture-perfect book-movie sort of way, but just in a, this is what could actually happen in real life. And that's also the sad part. I knew there couldn't be a happy ending, but just when he killed himself, and when she was the one who found him, I felt so devastated as a person for Violet because she'd already gone through the loss of Eleanor and now Finch. And it just tore my heart apart. I normally don't do this, but I'm going to suggest a song to go along with the book. And I would most definitely suggest If I Lose Myself, originally by One Republic, but the cover by Madeline Bailey and Corey Gray. I'll link it in the doobly-doo because it is just so beautiful of a song and it would be paired so greatly with the book itself. I'm highly considering rereading re re it. I've had a lot of luck actually this year with books I actually want to reread considering I never usually do that, but I'm thinking about next year just diving back into this and just having the book clench my heart and tear it apart, you know, again. Anyways, tell me in the comments below what you thought about this book, individual plot points, individual discussion, what you thought of the two characters and their dynamic and their relationship and their narration. It was such a unique book and one that is most definitely deserves every ounce of hype that it gets. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you had a good time. Keep calm and read on. Goodbye! while they are wandering around the state of Illinois. Right? It's Illinois. Oh my god, please don't say it's not Illinois. It's Indiana! What else do I say? Because this is a pretty hyped up book from Macmillan. I hope it's from Macmillan. I should really do research before this video. Yep, it's Macmillan. Wait, no it isn't. Ha ha ha, this is from Random House. This is how great of a booktuber I am.